Rabbi sahil wa yassil wa la tu'assil alayna ya Rabb. Oh my Lord, make it easy and make it simple and don't make it difficult for us. Muslims with progressive values are not always in agreement about the details, but one common principle forms the foundation of their thinking, human rights. This document is the manifesto for the organization Muslims for Progressive Values. We'll examine the five most controversial points of their manifesto. First, identity. Who is a real Muslim? Who gets to decide? Because unfortunately, you will find a lot of conservative groups who will say, you know, do you pray five times a day? Do you fast during Ramadan? Do you do this? They have all these hurdles that you have to jump through. And, and they will tell you, well, of course you have to jump through this because this is what being a Muslim is. And if you don't do these things, then you're not a Muslim. Everything from how observant or not you are to how you take your Islam out into the world is a deeply personal thing between you and God. I'm often asked in media appearances or in public appearances, you know, do you pray, do you fast? And I refuse to answer that question because that question is both a litmus test but also a way of putting me into a box because all these assumptions that come either from the yes or the no answer. But again, I think this is about this very fundamental understanding about who gets to say who is and who is not a Muslim. And in Islam, the answer is nobody. And so as a result, there are what I think some people would refer to as, you know, cafeteria Muslims, the way that you have cafeteria Jews or cafeteria Christians or whatever the case may be, by which people mean that you pick and choose. Only a fool or an ideologue accepts every precept that his community forces upon him, whether that be nationalism or citizenship or ethnicity or race or religion. I'm a Muslim. I don't, I don't subscribe to any sect. I don't accept the, the, the precepts of any, any community. No one tells me what to believe and what not to believe. My faith is between me and God and nobody else. The, the West, I'd say, is the, best, is, is the best place for Muslims to freely practice their religion and to be able to revive their religion. Um, it's not so much about um, uh, dogma or, or rigid rules. It's more of a, a, a guide to life. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, some, it's sort of um, it's a means to an end in a way because um, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that his mission was to perfect character, to perfect good character. And I believe that if you follow the, following the, um, the Quran and Sunnah that enables you to do that and to become a better person. Prayer is for our benefit not for God's benefit. So it, it's obviously, so it's something that I do when I really feel, feel the need to, to connect with, with my Creator. How important is the separation of church and state? The state must be neutral about religion for me to be the religious person I choose to be or not, because that is the only way to be religious. I absolutely agree with Abdullahi and Naim that to be a true Muslim, the state must be secular. Because if the state must run after me to pray, then that state has taken away my free will. And as a Muslim, I believe and I am taught and I agree that it, we have a free will, we exercise that free will, and it's how we exercise that free will that judges our moral standing with God. We believe that we cannot trust our Muslim community except in a secular state. The forces of darkness and dogmatism are so overwhelming when we have a state in which there isn't a separation of, of church and state. Pakistan, you know, was created with this very secular vision, and yet because it was created with this idea of Islam, of being an Islamic republic, it's just gone down into the dumps. I mean, the, the forces of religion think that they can have so much influence on issues of criminal punishment, uh, governance, civil society, that they are oppressive and, uh, and crushing. How does respect for human rights influence tolerance and pluralism? We began to talk about Ishtihad more and more over the past few years, especially when we began to see the threat that extremist Islam was posing to the faith as a whole. Because what they were doing was they were picking and choosing and, and practicing their own ways of reinterpreting the religion to justify their violence. I turned to my heart. 
I turn to my conscience. I turn to my own personal relationship with God where I, I no longer need someone to tell me what this verse means. I no longer need the permission of someone to think that this is right within Islam. And I think every Muslim should do that. Islam has given me the right to, to do this because one of the things that we boast about is that we don't have a clergy that stands between me and God. We don't have a pope. But as, but as someone so beautifully said it during one of these conferences that I go to, we have a million popes that stand in the way between me and God. At least, you know, if you're a Catholic, you know there's one guy. He's in the Vatican. He's the one you direct your anger to. But with Muslims, it's so thousands upon thousands of clerics that stand between me and God. Why should this man, who, as one young Muslim said, is so often so much less educated than me, so much less in tune with today's world than me, why should he, and it's always he, never a she, why should he be the one that I go to, to ask me how I can live a, a, a life that is relevant today? I think that the future of Islam is certainly going to be in the hands of the vast majority of the Muslim world that is under the age of 35. Some estimates, three quarters. Of, of Muslims. Certainly that's the case uh, amongst the diaspora in North America and Europe. Um, these young people are no longer influenced by the same political and social um, uh, occupations of their parents' generation. Um, in a sense, in the same way that all young people um, are anti-institutional. All young people are more interested in deciding for themselves what is right and wrong than being told what is right and wrong. In Islam, that movement is having an enormous effect on how this religion is going to be understood uh, in this coming century. If we did the right thing, we would say we have an interpretation of Islam inside of our community that's in our mosques, that's being preached from our pulpits, that's on, uh, on um, uh, you know, websites. It's in books, in our libraries, and we are going to extinguish it. We will admit that it comes out of some of our greatest scholars inside of our community. We will acknowledge that these scholars had their own agendas and that those agendas are not compatible anymore with tolerant living in the 21st century. And we will disown it, really, honestly. I mean, we will say that these people are shaming us. This interpretation of Islam is shaming us and we will not claim it inside of our community. We burn the books. We literally get rid of the books that in, have practice that interpretation of Islam. And unfortunately, many of those books come out of the government of Saudi Arabia. Many of the Qurans that are the worst translations of that ideology of Islam that preaches intolerance comes from Saudi Arabia. And we have to stop our romanticization of the government of Saudi Arabia as the keepers of the most honorable and noble interpretation of Islam and say, actually, this interpretation of the Quran that tells us that we should stay on the straight path, unlike the Jews and the Christians, this added parenthetical phrase that the Saudis put into their translation of the Quran is not acceptable. Some of my closest friends are Jewish really closest friends. And I think it's interesting that the, that the women I had my children with and we planned our babies with and all are Jewish. I mean, actually my very close friend is her parents are Holocaust survivors. So, you know, I, I just feel like that's really wonderful in a way to have that mix. Irshad Manji is a well-known Muslim lesbian. She finds no incompatibility between her sexuality and being Muslim. Allah does not make mistakes, she says. I had this conversation with my atheist friends all the time, where uh, I am, I am uh, actively involved in gay rights, I am actively involved in minority rights, I'm actively involved in, in women's rights. And so my atheist friends say, I don't get it. Like, are, you know, aren't you a Muslim? Uh, you know, how, how, how can you be pro-gay rights if you're a, a Muslim? And the answer is always the same. God does not make you a bigot. You either are a bigot or you're not. 
Neither does education make you not a bigot. Bigotry is not about this, it's about this. I absolutely support gay and lesbian rights. I think queer rights generally, be it gay, be it lesbian, be it bisexual, be it transgendered, be it even questioning, I, I absolutely support all of, the, all of those rights. And as a feminist, I especially ally, I, I, I call myself a proud queer ally because I recognize that the struggle for feminism and the struggle for queer rights is the same because it's a struggle against patriarchy. That, at the end of the day, is what unites us. What about a woman's rights over her own body? How important is veiling, for example? What's the difference between the hijab and the burqa? The issue is modesty. Here is the verse in the Quran that asks women to dress modestly. And say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty and ornaments except what must ordinarily appear thereof, that they should draw their veils over their bosoms. The instructions are ambiguous and therefore open to interpretation. So the woman who reads the Quran and says, I am absolutely certain that the Quran tells me to cover my hair, is as correct as the woman who reads it and says, I am absolutely certain it says not to. They are both absolutely right. There are many different views on what counts as modest dressed for men and women and I emphasize that both men and women have to dress modestly and when it comes to women some people will say that women don't have to cover their hair, some will say that they do and some will even say that they have to cover their face. And literally a year after I began wearing a headscarf I realized it was not me. So I wore a headscarf a total of nine years and I say it took me eight years to take it off. And that speaks in, in and of itself to how difficult it is for women who choose, and I chose it, no one forced this on me, for women who choose to veil in any form, how difficult it is for them to unveil. If you're going to wear a niqab and burqa and you're going to do that under the pretext of a woman's right to wear whatever you want to wear, we'll be the first in line to defend your rights to do that. But if you're going to use religion as the pretext of wearing a burqa niqab, then I will fight you on that one because it is completely out of bounds of Islam. We have a campaign at Mecca called Abni, Anti-Burqa Niqab Initiative. We say that this burqa, this niqab is not a veil, it is a mask. And so we never use the term full face veil, we say full face masking. Now full face masking has nothing to do with Islam. Full face masking is a pre-Islamic custom coming from Byzantium and from Persia that was later integrated into Muslim society and then given a religious veneer or justification. I detest the niqab or the full face veil. It, it terrifies the hell out of me. I think that it is a very dangerous equation of piety with the disappearance of women. I, I detest it because it basically renders a woman invisible. She's, I, can, I don't know who you are anymore. And I believe that nonverbal communication is just as important as verbal communication. Because if I was sitting here under a niqab conducting this interview with you, our dynamic would be very different. But I also think that Islam is very strong on identity and opinion and personality. And I feel that making sure the face is uncovered allows people to express who they are and assert some kind of identity. Mona El Tahawi has already identified the most controversial issue for Muslim women, sexual freedom. Azra Nomani has written a Bill of Rights for Muslim women in the bedroom. The Islamic Bill of Rights for Women in the Bedroom is an attempt to allow women in Muslim communities to own our own choices about our bodies and our hearts also, our right to marry who we want to marry, our right to be able to make choices about birth control, abortion, pregnancy, uh, and even whether or not we want to have sex. I assert really clearly, you know, our right to sexual pleasure which is basically a rejection of this idea inside of our, many of our Muslim communities that something like the clitoris is the ownership of the community. From the mosque to the bedroom, from the public space to the private space, you know, we can have self-determined lives. Perhaps the most important human rights issue is justice and fair treatment under law. 
In Washington, D.C., you can find a think tank called the Center for American Progress. Here they're holding a panel discussion on Sharia. The very word itself frightens Westerners because it makes them think of amputation and stoning. This panel discussion is co-sponsored by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. They assert that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. Islam is guided by principles of good conduct called sharia. The laws themselves are called fiqh. There are several schools of fiqh, each one having different interpretations for how best to achieve compliance with the Quran and Sunnah. According to progressive Muslims, Sharia is not immutable and can be interpreted to comply with the demands of contemporary society. Unfortunately, what happens in the realm of political rhetoric is that opinions suddenly turn into facts and people start to take these opinions and, and really believe in them and believe, you know, that, you know, high percentages of Muslims believe in, you know, violent jihad and all of these types of things. So ISPU started after September 11th, anticipating the need for fact-based analysis on Muslims in the U.S. and abroad. And so our organization really aims to publish timely information based on sort of taking academic research and bringing it into the public spheres. The term Sharia has no existence whatsoever in the Quran or Sunnah or for the first three centuries of Islam. That is, if you said Sharia to a Muslim of the first century or the second century and the third century of Islam, he wouldn't know what you are talking about. It's a term that was coined in the third century in a very limited way and had a very different meaning even at that time. I mean, Sharia is not immutable, cannot possibly be immutable because it's a product of human understanding and experience. Progressive Muslims are opposed to the death penalty and don't think it belongs in the 21st century. They say all civilized people should campaign for its abolition. Tariq Ramadan has commented publicly on it. We'll end this program with two wise scholars who leave us with significant ideas to take away. One is Muslim, the other is not. What we are seeing is diversity of opinion. But in the short term, as happened in Reform and Roman Catholicism, the conservatives are in the majority. The conservatives have control of things, and so they are very resistant to the kinds of reformist change that in fact is taking place. And when you look at Judaism, I love the example of Judaism because the very way in which we refer to Jews give you a sense of different interpretations. We talk about orthodox, ultra-orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist, okay? Uh, it's very clear, okay? We're gonna see that diversity emerging even more and more within Islam, just as we see it in Christianity today. But that the real challenge in the 21st century is pluralism and is a modern notion of pluralism, which means that pluralism and tolerance aren't simply the, the coexistence. It's about respect and respecting the other. And respecting the other is based on what we share in common, but also respecting the fact that the other has a right to differ. Not all Muslims agree with me on this. Not all Christians agree with me. No, not all Europeans agree with me on this. There is no agreement at that simplistic level. I think the point is that we have to cultivate consensus. So when, when you look at our discourses about gender, about sexual orientation, about race, and see how Consensus over values was promoted over time by people struggling for those values and for that discourse that will promote consensus. That is how it happens. It is not going to happen by itself. 
But it has happened so many times over so many issues that we know it can happen again. Thank you for your attention. We hope the nine voices you heard will give you new ideas about Islam. Goodbye, and as we say in Arabic, shukran wa ma'asalam.